Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Study with Brother Don. I'm Brother Don, and it's good to be here. Good to be with you right here today in Bible Study Central. And uh, <clears throat> I'm just uh, I'm telling you, I say this <clears throat> every week, but if it's going to happen in Bible study, it's going to happen right here. Amen. That's it. Okay, we, this, the study tonight, I, I, I think, is going to be excellent. I'm, I'm excited about it. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 21. But I want to say just two things about events, current events, the news, things of that nature. And one is, the first one, is, last night, I, I was up uh, pretty late last night doing some reading and, and watching some things on... Uh, on the news and, and, and what I'm what I'm wanting to say about this, you know, Isaiah says, Woe to those who call you know, evil good and good evil and you know, who've turned justice upside down and things of that nature. And part of what I was watching last night, I was watching some of the news feeds that I don't normally watch. CNN, I watched a little bit of that. Uh, I watched some MSNBC, some Bloomberg, and then I watched some others, some of those that I, I, I do watch sometime, and I was just amazed. And uh, one of the things that that really shocked me, and I, I mean, I, I know this stuff is happening because, you know, you read about it and you see glimpses of it, but then when you actually see it, for example, if you watch... Uh, say, if you watch news out of Australia, which I do every now and then, I know they're liberal, but they tend to show what's happening over here in our government a little bit better than, than CNN does. The BBC, I watch them a bit, and then I watch quite a bit of the news out of Israel. Uh, I've got two or three subscription to different Israeli news sources. But if you watch all of them, and they're showing all these clips of Biden and, you know, and they're saying, you know, uh, he can't, he can't remember anything anymore. He, when he comes on stage, he doesn't know where he's supposed to go. Uh, and they quote the findings of, 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 um, her, that, uh, special investigator, her, when he was investigating Biden for having, um, the uh, top secret documents at his house. And you'll remember that he said that, uh, the reason why he didn't press charges was because he thought that if it went to a jury, the jury would find Biden to be like an old, old forgetful man and just they, they would just pass it off. But then you turn over to some of the other news sources and they are talking about how alert Biden is, how in command he is of everything that he does, of, of his White House staff and all that. You know, and, and I'm sitting there saying, people, all you got to do is look at the videos and you can tell he's not alert and not in command and nothing. But my point is, is that the news in particular here in our country, the United States, they just turn things upside down. They just say whatever they want to say, whatever their their particular narrative is. Whatever truth, and I say that in quotes, that they are trying to push, that's what they say. And uh, I just, after watching that, it, 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 it amazed me, it upsets me that our country has gotten to this stage, you know, where, where wickedness is just in control of everything. And, and there is no truth anymore. Truth is, is just what you want it to be. And uh, so uh, I, I guess saying all that, uh, I would say to you, be very careful where you get your news. And if you hear something, research it, find out. Don't, don't, don't just go spreading something. Find out the truth before you relay it. I mean, that's, that's part of my, my preaching, teaching, and studying. It is, I'm going to say a solid 40% of it is just research. Just looking to make sure that what I'm going to say, what I'm going to do is actually the truth. The second thing I wanted to, to say is, <clears throat> and this has to do with looking toward, not that I am, 
but looking toward a one world government and, and all of the nations coming together and, you know, there being a one world government, which we know is coming. And here's what got me to thinking about that and thinking how close we are to a one world government. I'm still digging around on the World Health Organization, trying to find out exactly what they've done, what they've pushed. And, but, and, and that'll come maybe in another week or two because I'm not ready to talk about that yet. But here's what, what got me to thinking. Right now, part of what the United States, part of their problem with Israel is, is of course they're, they're wanting Israel to do everything that they say. They're wanting Israel to stop the attacks in Rafah you know, and pretty much they're wanting Israel to stop the war altogether. And so what they have done, and they've done this now for a month or so, and I've already talked a little bit about it, is they've told Israel, our government has told Israel that, yes, we will supply you with arms, but you can only use them for certain things. And one of the stipulations was, is that you can't go into Rafa with the arms that we will supply you. And then they came back and said, okay, well, just use little bombs, don't use big bombs. But Israel went ahead and did it anyway. So one country, Israel, is in a, a battle for their life, for their very existence. And one country, the United States, is telling Israel, trying to tell Israel what they can and can't do in battle. So like it's any of our business. Well, you dig around, you watch some news, you read some stuff and you find out, okay, Ukraine is in a battle for its very existence. Russia is trying to, to take Ukraine and make it a part of Russia again. A lot of European nations, as well as the United States, is supplying the Ukraine with, with various missiles, armaments, things. Last week, Europe, some of the nations in Europe, I think France was one of them, told the Ukraine that they could go ahead and use some of the armaments they had told sold them for attacks deeper in Russia. So that means that they told Ukraine before that they couldn't. And so I'm, I'm thinking again, all right, here we go. We got, we got one country right here, the Ukraine, fighting for their survival. You've got these other countries over here saying, okay, while you're fighting, you can only do this. You, can, you can't use this for that. And, and what it is, is pointing to, if, if things continue to go like they are, is eventually a one world government. And, and we'll be telling people, you can go to war, you can't go to war, you can do this, you can't do that. And when you go to affecting wars like that, and not, I'm, I'm not that I'm for war, but you know as well as I do, as long as there's people, there's going to be wars. But then you go to trying to tell somebody who's fighting for their very existence I'm going to sell you some bullets, but you can't use them. I'm going to sell you some bullets, but you can only shoot them that direction. You can't shoot them this direction. You know, that, folks, to me, that just doesn't make sense. But it's leading to a one world government. And eventually, as Scripture tells us, we've looked at it in several places and we'll look at it again in the future. That's what's coming. All right, that's enough of the news right now because the rest of the news that's going on right now, I don't even want to talk about because it it's just so ignorant. But anyway, Revelation chapter 21. Last For the last month, maybe two months, we've been looking at the good part of prophecy and, and good simply to the meaning that these are the things that we as children of God are looking for and what's going to happen to us in the future. We talked about the rapture. We talked about the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb. We spent a couple of weeks on the millennial reign of Christ. Last week, we talked about the end of the millennial reign and some things that are going to happen during the millennial, and we answered some questions. And so now at the end of the millennial, as we talked about last week, 
couple, two things are going to happen. And again, I said, I didn't know the exact order of these two things. I just know that they're going to happen and they could happen simultaneously. One is second Peter chapter three, the heavens and the earth will be dissolved by fire, renovated, what, whichever way you want to go with that. And the other is the, the great white throne. And you can read that if you'll back up into Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15 the great white throne. And actually that is the last thing that is going to happen. And, and I want to put it this way in what we know of as time, because at the end of the millennial, the heavens and the earth will be dissolved by fire, the great white throne. And then after that is Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22 which is eternity. And in eternity, there will be no time. Time won't matter anymore. We're going to live forever. So nobody's going to walk around and say, hey, what time is it? Or, or what time are we? Well, it won't matter because we'll be in eternity and time will be no more. So kind of at Revelation 21, uh, beginning at Revelation 21, you could just write up there, maybe if you wanted to, no more time because now we enter eternity. And at this point, everybody who is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, everybody who has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb will be in their new eternal bodies. And as we're going to see when we get down to verse 4, that there's going to be no more aging, no more pain. We're going to live in a paradise. And we'll talk about that <clears throat> if not next week, then the week after that. But <clears throat> let's just look real quick. Revelation chapter 21, and I want to read verses one through eight, and then I want to talk about a couple of things. So John says, heavens and earth now have been dissolved by fire. All judgment is over. Those who have rejected Christ and followed Satan are in the lake of fire. And now we are entering eternity. And John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling place is with humanity and he will live with them. They will be his people's and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And he also said, Right, because these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. The one who conquers will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowards, faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Amen. What a passage of scripture. And I know you've heard this preached on and, and read several times, but folks, this in, in, in eight verses, this is what you and I are looking for. Eternity, heaven, being with God, and all of this is passed away. From this point on, there will be no more sin, no more wickedness. Remember, at the end of the millennial reign, Satan was loosed for, for just a season. He went out and deceived the nations. They were defeated again in the final battle. And then they stood before the great white throne. And once the great white throne is over and all of these people and Satan and, and all of his minions are, are cast into the lake of fire, there will be no more sin and no more wickedness. It will all be peace and righteousness. 
Now, a couple of things about this passage. First of all, in verse 1, he says, And the sea was no more. And, and I've, I've read a lot of things about that. I've heard a lot of different discussion about what that actually means. There are some that, that say it, it, it means masses or multitudes of people because in other places in Scripture, the sea, as, as in the beast rose up from the, the sea or from the sand of the sea or from the shore, and, and that represents the people. He rose up out of all of the peoples or all of the nations. And I don't really think that's what he's talking about here because in heaven, there's going to be quite a multitude of people. We already know, you know, back earlier in chapter six, and I believe it's in chapter nine where John said he saw a, a host standing before the throne, you know, that no one, no man could number. And the 144,000, that they're going to reach a multitude of people that are going to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I don't think that's what it's talking about. I think it has a practical application. Now, we're going to see later on when we look at script, when we read about heaven, that there are going to be some things in heaven that are going to be missing that we have now. And one of them is going to be the sun. There will be no sun in heaven in eternity because scripture says that God will be the light. His glory will be the light. It, it will penetrate everything, and the Lamb will be their lamp. So there will be no sun. Uh, most likely, there will be no thunderstorms, no, you know, storms like what we've had here in East Texas the last few days. And so what I think he's talking about here when he says, and the sea was no more, is I think he literally means the sea, the Pacific Ocean, the, the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, no more seas. The Atlantic Ocean, they'll all be gone. And I think the reason being is because in our ecological system today, we need the sea for the evaporation, just for the, the way that the ecological system works. Now, I'm not a, I'm an ecologist. I'm not a physicist. Phys, I'm not one of those. But I do know that there is an ecological system and the way that the water moves. And, and, you know, it was explained to me like when I was a kid, it evaporates up from the seas. It gets in the clouds. It comes over and it rains, becomes fresh water and goes through the rivers, the creeks, the lakes, and eventually back to the sea. And it just keeps this cycle going. In heaven, we won't need that. We need it today to sustain life on earth, but in heaven, we won't need that. So I think that's what he's talking about. I think literally it, it, it's the sea and there will be no more seas. We know there will be rivers. The river of life will be flowing from the throne of God. Uh, we talked about in Ezekiel, one of my favorite, that the fishermen were fishing were, were fishing by the, the river and spreading out their nets. So, uh, you know, we know there's going to be water, but there's not going to be sees, I don't think. And that's what I think he means here. And then in verse two, again, he talks about the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And we talked about this a little bit last week, but why would John describe the new Jerusalem as a bride adorned for her husband. We know that the church is the bride of Christ. We've already seen that in other studies. The marriage supper of the lamb, the bride has made herself ready. So why does he call the new Jerusalem a bride adorned for her? And if you look in, uh, is it, uh, the look in verse 9, in verse 9, he says, Then one of the seven angels who had held the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, and he says, Come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And then he carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So again, he refers to the city of Jerusalem as the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Okay, and as I told you last week, I think the reason he does that is because we are in the new Jerusalem as it comes down from heaven to earth. I think we're in it. The reason why I think that is because 
after the millennial reign, we can't be here on earth because the heavens and the earth, 2 Peter 3, will be destroyed by fire. I don't think we'll be at the great white throne. I think we'll be somewhere else. We don't really have any business there at the great white throne. Has nothing to do with us. So where are we when all of this is going on? I think we are in the new Jerusalem. John chapter 14, Jesus said, I go away and prepare a place for you. I think that place is the new Jerusalem, our dwelling place. And so when John sees it coming down, he's having this vision and the angel is showing him all this and he sees this new Jerusalem coming down. We, the church, the bride of Christ, all of the redeemed are in there. And that's why he calls it the bride. Now, I may be wrong, but that's what I think, okay? And uh, you're welcome to disagree with me on that point, but uh, that's what I think. And then verse three, and I, I wanna say this about verse three. I wanna say that this is what, this verse right here is what everything is about and what everything has been about since God created the heavens and the earth, all the way back in Genesis chapter one. And listen to what he says, verse three. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling or his tabernacle, his place of residence is with humanity. Your Bible might say mankind. And he will live with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and will be their God. Folks, that's what it's all about. God wants to be with his people. He wants to live with them. He wants to walk among them. He wants to fellowship with them, share love back and forth with them. That's what it's all about. Let me give you a quick little tour through scripture and show you what I mean. Back in Genesis chapter three, when God created the heavens and the earth, he created the garden of Eden and he put man in it. And this verse in Genesis chapter three, verse uh, eight is, is a, a fairly often used verse to prove that in the garden of Eden, most likely Adam and Eve actually walked and talked with God. They actually fellowship with him, possibly face to face, because remember, they were innocent. They, they didn't have sin when they were born. They didn't have this when they were created. They didn't even have the sin nature. And if you remember in Genesis chapter three, after they had sinned, the scripture says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. Now they hid from him because they had sinned. Whereas probably before this, when God came walking through the garden, they went to meet him and they fellowshiped with him. That's why God created the heavens and the earth and the garden to fellowship with man. But even after sin, and even after the way that the children of Israel acted after God brought them out of Egypt, listen to what Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8 says. God speaking to Moses, they're, they're there in the wilderness, and God says they are to make a sanctuary or tabernacle for me so that I may dwell among them. What did God want? to dwell among his people, to fellowship with them, to be with them. And then in John chapter 17, verse three, we come on now to the New Testament. And, and I'm not gonna take time to go through the Old Testament and show you in Ezekiel, the, the glory of God leaving the tabernacle and going back to heaven. Uh, we'll talk about some of that later on. But now we come to the New Testament, the gospels in particular, John 17, 3, and Jesus describes salvation, eternal life like this. He said, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. So you could boil salvation down 
And you could say, okay, what is salvation really all about? Well, it's about our forgiveness of sins. It's about regeneration. <clears throat> but what is it really all about? It's about us being able to know God. It's about us being able to fellowship with God, God to dwell with us and be our God. And how does he do that now? In the church age, in the day that we live in, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? We are the dwelling place of God now. 2 Corinthians 6, 16, and what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will dwell and walk among them and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Amen? That is what it's all about. That's what it's always been about. And how does John describe heaven when we get there? Again, verse 3, look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Woo. Folks, that's what God wants right now. I'm going to touch on that here in, in, in just a minute. That's how I'm going to close it out. A little bit of heaven right now here on earth. But that's what God desires. He doesn't desire that anyone go to hell. The scripture's clear about that. Even in the Old Testament, Ezekiel, the Lord said, tell them that I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his wicked ways and, and live. And he tells us in the New Testament, the four gospels, he, Emmanuel, God with us, he came to dwell with us. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit indwelling us, that is God, Jesus indwelling us. Remember in John, I believe it's chapter uh, 14 or 15, but Jesus said, I will send the Holy Spirit to you. I will come to you. The Father and I will dwell with them and we will make ourselves known to them. That's what God wants. And when we get to heaven, when we get to eternity, we're going to see Jesus before that. John, 1 John chapter 3 tells us, you know, that when we're raptured out of here, we're going to see Jesus. But in eternity, we're going to walk and talk with him. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but in eternity, we're, we're going to be on earth and on heaven, the new heaven, the new earth. We're, we're going to dwell probably mostly on the new earth, but God's going to be with us. Christ is going to walk among us, and we'll be able to fellowship not only with each other, but with him. That's what God's always wanted. That's why he gave his only begotten son to die for our sin so that we could be born again, born from above, and fellowship with him. And then verse 4, and this is what we look for. We're, we're human, and God knows that. We're still controlled by human desires, no, no matter how spiritual we get, how holy we grow to be, we're still human. And we're still bound in this physical body. So here's what we look for. Verse 4, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. That's what we look for. And and yeah, it, it, it gets everybody excited. When, I, when I'm pondering on these things and when I'm thinking about things to come, especially um, you, you get a little older, you start having health problems. Maybe you're younger and you're having health problems, but you get older and you get slower and arthritis and, you know, first one thing and another, you can't remember, you know, what you were doing anymore. 
And we all look forward to that day when there will be, and, and then this, he just flat says it, and pain will be no more. And I'm, I'm waiting for that. Man, I am waiting for that. No more death. You see, the problem we have right now, Paul describes it in Romans chapter 8, verse 23. He says, not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. That's the problem. We may be born again, but that's in our spirit. That's on the inside. We still live in a physical body that is subject to a cursed world. That's why we get old. That's why we hurt. That's why when you work, it wears you out. But there's coming a day when it won't anymore. And then verses five and six, seven, God gives us his promise, it's gonna happen. He says, look, I'm making everything new. Write this down because these words are faithful and true. Folks, what he has told us in verses one through four, it's going to happen. It's faithful. It's true. God keeps his promise. And as he says in verse six, then he said to me, it's done. It's settled. This is going to happen. But he gives us a warning in verse eight. And he lists several things here. I'm not going to read it all again. Cowards, faithless, faithless, murderous. Well, I'm going to read it anyway. Sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. He says their share will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. I've described this to you before. What he means here by the second death is separation from God. Eternity separated from God in the lake of fire. And we discussed that uh, last week where he told him that the lake of fire would be forever and ever. Satan's punishment would be eternal. Uh, 20, chapter 20, verse 10, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are. Notice that the beast and the false prophet are. That means presently they are still there. They don't get thrown in there and burn up and, and they're gone. They're there. That's where they live. That's where they exist. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Folks, you don't want to go to hell. You may not right now want to serve God. You may have a distorted understanding of God. You may have a, a distorted view of the church and of Christians because, yes, Christians are not perfect. We still make mistakes. But just because you knew a church that did something wrong or, or caused you problems, just because you knew a Christian that sinned, that's no reason to go to hell, especially when all you have to do is submit your life to Jesus Christ. Take him as Lord and Savior, and he will save you, and he will give you eternal life if you will submit to him. Don't go to hell. And then I want to close this. I want to say this. We can have a touch of heaven here on earth now. We can. Look again, if you would, at verse four. All those things that we want. He'll wipe away every tear. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more. And here's why. He says, because the previous things have passed away. Now, when I read that, my mind went straight to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 17, where the Lord says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. We, even in this life, even in this physical body, subject to the curse of this world, we are a new creation. We are born again from above. We now 
have the spiritual ability to fellowship with God. And because we have been changed, because we have been born again, and because God's Holy Spirit indwells us, we can have a touch of heaven now. We can fellowship with God. We can know a, a, a little bit of the glory of heaven right now in our lives. And I think the only thing that that stops us, that holds us back, is it's a matter of how much we are willing to surrender of our lives to live holy and righteous before God today, as opposed to how close to the world can I live and still be a Christian? And I think we see way too much of that in too many Christians' lives. They want to be saved. They want to go to heaven. They want to know God's blessing, but they want to hold on to a lot of the things of the world. And I think the reason why we don't have any more heaven on earth than we do is because we are not willing to submit ourselves to die to self, to sacrifice our life, to know the holiness and righteousness of God right now. And folks, that, that's what I want. That's what I'm striving for. I want to know God. I want to fellowship with him now, especially as, as the days grow darker and we get nearer and nearer to the end of time. I want him with me, alive, vibrant, not, not a stale relationship where I've got to scream out, oh God, please, oh God. No, I want to be walking with him, talking with him. I want to know that when I walk around that next corner and literally all hell breaks loose in my life, I want to know that God is right there and he's telling me, he's patting me on the shoulder and saying, don't worry, child, I've got this. That's what I want. Amen. Heaven on earth. We're going to have heaven. God said it's done. It's settled. But I want to know him in that way right now. God bless you. Thank you for being with me. It's been, it's been a pleasure to share this passage of scripture with you. And uh, next week, we'll move on into the, the new city and into the new heaven and the new earth. And we'll look at some, some things and, and, and kind of a, a hint or an idea of, of what we will be doing in heaven. What, what, what are we going to do for all eternity? And we'll, we'll look at that next week. Thank you for your prayers. Things are going good. Uh, I don't go back to the doctor for, I think, another uh, next quarter. I, I gotta, I'll got i go back after three months. So it's been three, three and a half weeks. And so I'll go back for uh, more tests and see if, if my diet, my change of lifestyle, things I'm doing are working. Uh, yeah, thank you for your prayers because so far I haven't had very much trouble staying on my diet. I haven't had the cravings, the urges that I thought I would uh, for certain things. Um, um, I, I appreciate your prayers. And uh, we need to be praying for each other. One of our listeners, or one of our, our regular viewers, um, I'm, I'm not going to say his name. You, you can probably see it in the comments. Had a stroke the other day. So we need to be praying for him, praying for each other. Uh, I want to say hi again to, I believe it's Delaware. I keep forgetting to look and write it down. But there's a sister, and I believe it's in Delaware, that, that follows pretty closely. I just want to say thank you for that and, and hello and then a brother in North or South Carolina. And if I remember right, he said he listens on his way to work in the mornings. I, I don't remember, but it, it's just exciting to know that, that I'm reaching people, to know that there's people out there that want to study the word of God and want to hear the word of God. And, and it's exciting. So just let's pray for each other. Amen. God bless you. And I'll see you next week.